Welcome to another video on the art of electronics or learning the art of electronics, the lab manual. The uh, sheet I have over here is uh, my cheat sheet on operational amplifiers, which is where we're going to go today. But before we get there, I wanted to show you something. First, let's just take a look at the oscilloscope. And in this case, I'm not using the analog discovery, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. I'm using the Rigol. This uh, scope has been upgraded to uh, 500 megahertz bandwidth. And you notice that there is a frequency there that varies all over the place depending on where the trigger is set. But now let's go up and look at the signal on the DSA-815, the spectrum analyzer. It's set up for 200 megahertz on the right. And you notice that roughly in the middle, around 100 megahertz, there are a lot of different signals that are being generated by this so what is this uh, special device and why am I showing it? Well, it's actually a circuit that you'll find in the book that we've been talking about. It's a 2N3904 and it's configured as an emitter follower right up there and notice that it's nothing more than a 15 volt supply and a 3904 but it has a fairly long uh, supply lead 470 ohm resistor in the emitter the base is taken to ground through a 0.01 microfarad capacitor let me show you the, the circuit again Here is the capacitor, and up here is the long clip lead leading to the power supply. And the author says, this is one of their favorite little, he calls it jamming circuit, because they often use it to jam a local radio station in their lab that uh, is apparently annoying to them. So it generates a wide swath of frequencies in the FM radio band, which is 100 megahertz plus or minus some. And, pardon the uh, the motion sickness, as we see in the spectrum analyzer, that's exactly what it's doing. So I say, why am I showing you this? Well, the point is that a relatively innocuous circuit, who'd have thought that a simple, cheap, 3904 in an emitter follower could be putting out significant energy in the middle of the 100 megahertz FM band. Well, the answer is virtually any circuit can do things like this. And because these frequencies are way up beyond the capabilities of the analog discovery, you would never see them. So there is a lesson to be learned when you're using the analog discovery, you have to keep in mind that the 30 megahertz upper frequency limit really does mean that if you have parasitic oscillation or other things in your circuits, you won't probably see it. You'll feel it because when you, as you're trying to measure the circuit or, or change its characteristics, it'll seem to be all over the place and you'll figure, well, must have a bad transistor, or wonder what's going on here. Well, it's probably because your circuit is oscillating at some high frequency, and if your scope won't go that high, now like I say, this oscilloscope will go that high, it will go to uh, 500 megahertz, but most won't, 
especially not the ones you're likely to find in the lab and definitely not the analog discovery. So I'm talking about this because one of the things we're going to be uh, dealing with in this lesson is operational amplifiers and the difference between what the author calls the golden rule world, that is the simplifying assumption rule, and the real world. So let's talk about that a little bit. With operational amplifiers, you're dealing with a fairly sophisticated circuit that's been developed over quite a long period of time. The first operational amplifiers were actually developed for use in analog computers back in the 1930s and 40s and were very highly developed during World War II. Things like uh, the torpedo aiming computers on board submarines were analog computers. And they generally, of course, used vacuum tubes in the day. Later, after integrated circuits came along in the 1960s, some integrated operational amplifiers came along. The first one was a 709. <laughs> this was a real bear to work with. Uh, it was great for its day. It was really uh, high-tech at the time. But it had a number of issues and was very likely to run away with, uh, with itself because it was not, uh, it was very unstable, let's put it that way, depending on the circuit configuration. Later, an improved version of it called the 741 was released. These were by Fairchild, and the guy who developed both of these, his name is Jim Whittler, was very famous in uh, integrated circuit operational amps. But one of the things they touted about the 741 was that it was unconditionally stable. Well, what they really meant was it was a lot more stable than the 709, but there's no such thing as unconditionally stable. Because as you know, if you use positive feedback, any circuit is going, any circuit with gain is going to be, uh, oscillate. So uh, let's take a look at what we're going to talk about in this video and then develop over the next few videos with some with some real world experiments. The operational amplifier world can be thought of in two ways. On the left is what the author calls the golden rule world. That is, you make a lot of assumptions about the amplifier that make it very easy for you to put a circuit together. For example, you assume that it has, that the amp has infinite gain, when in reality, it only has most amps between 80 and 120 dB of gain. We also assume that it has infinite frequency response. Well, as we'll find out, that, that, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big question. Infinite slew rate. This is one that people don't pay a lot of attention to. They think, well, if you got good frequency response, you can drive it all the way up to that frequency. Well, it depends on the voltage you're driving it to, because there's a thing called slew rate that we will talk about uh, when we get to the experiments. The next two have to do with the inputs. The uh, assumption is that there are no current flows into an operational amplifier's inputs. And further, that there is absolutely no difference between the two inputs, that is, the zero offset voltage, and that the input impedance is infinite, which of course is consistent with the idea of no input current. Also, that the output uh, impedance is zero, when in fact it really isn't. It's, uh, it may be down in the 100 ohm category but we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. In an earlier video, we talked about common mode rejection ratio, and one of the reasons that I introduced that in the differential amplifier video was because the assumption in the golden rule world is that that's infinite, when in fact, it's really only about 50 to 100 dB uh, in practice, and it can get better or worse depending on how you lay out and design your circuit. An area that gets very little uh, attention but should get more is the power supply rejection ratio. That is, how sensitive is the output of the op amp to changes in the power supply. The reason that's important is, in many cases, noise 
High frequency noise, including things like the parasitics we saw earlier with that 3904, get into the power supply rails and get distributed around the chassis. And if the operational amplifier isn't uh, doesn't reject those, they can show up on the output, cause all sorts of problems. There, generally, the assumption is that there's no noise in the amplifier. In other words, whatever noise comes in is amplified, but the amplifier itself generates no noise. But in fact, there is noise that is present. And finally, that the output can go from from the full negative to full positive, or in the case of a single supply, from zero to the, the full supply. There are op amps that are near rail to rail, but you pay some performance penalties to get that, and we'll talk about some of those. So what is the reason for talking about these differences? Well, depending on how you use feedback, you can influence a lot of these issues. Output impedance, for example. Uh, uh, input or offset voltage. You can trim an, an amplifier to essentially have zero uh, offset voltage, and so on. So, feedback is the savior, right? Well, yes, but it can also be the problem. And if you've watched some of my earlier videos on uh, feedback, I'm not going to repeat them here, but you'll realize that feedback helps a lot when properly applied. And here we're talking about negative feedback. But because feedback is not ideal either, you wind up uh, with potential problems being introduced by feedback. And we'll talk about a few of those. So let's take a look at a simple operational amplifier circuit being measured with the analog discovery. I've set up this circuit on a breadboard, which we'll look at in a second. <clears throat> this is a 741 op amp. I'm using plus and minus 5 volts as the power supplies off the analog discovery. And channel 2 of the analog discovery, that is scope channel 2, is connected to the output pin 6. There are three feedback resistors, and I have provided some jumper wires that I can pull for a couple of these, so that, in essence, I can go from approximately 1K of feedback to 10K of feedback or 100K of feedback. Those resistors are tied back to the negative input, and there is a 1K resistor to ground. I'm using a capacitor to isolate the waveform generator and channel 1 of the oscilloscope. The uh, positive input, or, or the non-inverting input, is connected through a 1K to ground, and the inverting input through a 1K to ground, this is just to balance the, the offset currents in the amplifier. No, we aren't going to talk about any of these issues in this video. What are, we are going to talk about is how you have to trade off some of those characteristics that we talked about in order to get uh, another set of characteristics that you prefer. So what we are going to be doing is take it for, from me that if you don't yet know how op amps are set up, basically if you take the ratio of the feedback resistor to the input resistor, that is the closed-loop gain of the system. So 1K and 1K means a closed-loop gain of 1, approximately. Uh, it depends on whether you're using the inverting or non-inverting, but let's not, let's not go into a lot of details. Basically, the gain of this stage is approximately 1 when this resistor is in there. When I pull this jumper, then there will only be a 10K and a 100K, and of course the 10K will dominate, and the gain of this stage will go up to about 10. Then when I pull this jumper, the stage gain will go up to 100 over 1, or 100, uh, once again, approximately. I have the waveform gen and channel 1 set up as the inputs so that I can run the network analyzer of the analog discovery, which is a feature that uh, is one of the relatively unique features of the analog discovery. It's hard to do this kind of network analysis with an ordinary oscilloscope and a function gen. It can be done with a sweep generator, but it's, uh, 
it involves a bit of setup and with the analog discovery all you have to do is click one button on the uh, waveforms uh, window. So let's take a look at the circuit. It's over here. And now let's move over and look at the waveforms software running the network analyzer. What you see, and I think what I may do is switch to that view and see if it shows up a little better in the uh, yeah, I think that might be a little better picture in the camera. So at the top what you see is the gain of the stage. The yellow line is the, pardon me I bumped it, uh, let it, let me let it settle back down again. The, uh, the yellow line is the input and the blue line is the output up here and you'll see that the, the, the stage says it has a little bit of gain and that's because of variation in resistor tolerances but basically it has a gain of one. At the bottom is the phase characteristics. This is a megahertz and you'll notice that the gain begins to fall off near a megahertz and continues to go on down above that. Now what I'm going to do is pull the first jumper. That is, I'm going to remove the 1K resistor and go to a gain of 10. Notice now that relative to this gain, the gain uh, out near a megahertz is much lower. It's not really that the gain is lower at a megahertz, it's just that the gain is higher before that. So if you're doing 3 dB analysis, in other words, if you're looking for the normal definition of bandwidth, you define that relative to the middle of the band. And therefore, this uh, would indicate that you have a narrower frequency response. But understand that's just a, a definitional issue because what you really have is more gain in the middle. You still have the same gain at the high frequency. Now what I'm going to do, and watch that high frequency point as I pull the second jumper. Notice the high frequency point doesn't change. And the reason that I'm showing this is to illustrate that while you can trade off gain for bandwidth, notice we're getting a lot of gain now. This is uh, 38 dB of gain. Uh, actual amplification at the high frequency uh, is the same as it was under the other conditions. One reason I wanted to say this is there are a lot of uh, video explanations and textbook explanations that talk about how the, the, the bandwidth changes of the amplifier. Well, it really doesn't. Actually, what changes is your definition of bandwidth. If you define the bandwidth as, I bumped it again, uh, as the frequency at which you have maximum gain relative to when, when that gain has fallen off by 3 dB, well then the bandwidth of this, that's 38, so 35 dB is going to be about here. But you're still getting the same gain out at this frequency as you were before. It's just that you're getting a lot more at this lower frequency. Later when we see feedback formulas and so on, if we do some 
subsequent videos, I'll explain to you how another myth, that is the myth that somehow the amplifier, the op amp, looks at its input and looks at its output and adjusts its input until the output, that's just frankly bunk. It's just Ohm's law. But we'll get to that in a future video. In the meantime, I hope what I've shown you is that you often can trade off various parameters one against the other. Get a little better on this, might get a little worse on that. So you, you can get a lot more gain, but your 3 dB bandwidth is going to be narrower. We'll get into some of the details of these things perhaps in some future videos, depending on how many we do in this series. But for now, the point of all of this is to try to convince you that going back to the difference between the golden rule world and the real world, real world view is in the real world you don't get perfection. These are simplifications designed to allow you to approximate the response. In the real world you get what you get and you have to measure it. So, for example, we got some high frequency roll off. As we tried to raise the gain, by lowering the, the uh, or by increasing the value of the feedback resistor, our high frequency uh, response really didn't change, but what happened is the mid frequency changed, and therefore the relative gain from low frequency to high frequency changed. Those are the sorts of trade offs that you get all the time with operational amplifiers. So I hope this has been uh, at least useful, and more importantly, I hope that it's a good basis on which we can do some future work with operational amplifiers and feedback. Uh, in the meantime, look forward to some more videos and have a nice day.